Chris, I will be presenting this lecture. I'm being assisted by Mr. Mazzanella. And um, I hope you can see the slides clearly. I have a, some technical issue this morning that I don't can't seem to be able to sort out. So I hope that you can, I will in any case upload the slides afterwards for you as well. So we're dealing with trusts this morning. Um, can you see the second slide? What is a trust? Yes, Prof. Okay. So in general terms, a trust uh, is a legal institution. And we have three parties in that. We have the founder. And the founder is the person that starts the trust or that creates the trust. Um, he gives certain property to, to one person who must administer it. And we call that a trustee, that, that person that administers it. That person is, has a fiduciary capacity. Um, and the third party in this trust relationship is the beneficiary. So that the property is administered for the benefit of this third party, the, the, the beneficiary. Now, we see in this area of our law that there's an act, Section 1 of the Trust Property Control Act, um, also defines what a trust is. It's a very long, long definition, but from the definition, you can see that a trust founder gives property to a trustee. The trustee owns and controls the property, but not for his own benefit, for the benefit of the beneficiary. The testator can also give the property to the beneficiary in ownership. Then the trustee only administers the property for the benefit of the beneficiary. So we have these two options. Either the trustee is the owner or the beneficiary is the owner, but it's always for the benefit of the beneficiary. Um, now, let me see. Can you see the second slide, part, uh, parties to a testamentary trust? Yes, Prof, it's a third slide, yes. Okay. Uh, the trust founder, the parties is the trust founder, the trustee and the beneficiary. So the trust founder is the person who in his will, because we're dealing, we you can make a trust also between living people, and it's called the trustee inter vivos. But we are dealing with a trust created in a will, since we're talking about the law of succession, and that is called a testamentary trust or a trust mortis causa. Um, so the trust found in this case will be the test, the the uh, person who makes the will. So he will bequeath property in his will or her will to a trustee and provides how the trust property must be administered. The trustee will administer the property in accordance with the provisions in the will for the benefit of the beneficiary. Now, you'll see at the bottom there, I've, I've said the trustee usually receives ownership over the trust property. That is called an ownership trust. But when the beneficiary is the owner, the trust is called a bevin trust. Um, the trustee will still administer the trust property. There's still a trustee involved. And then the beneficiary, the third party, he or she receives some benefit from the property, either income during the existence of the trust or capital at the end of the trust. So you can be an income beneficiary or a capital beneficiary. Uh, an income beneficiary receives income in the form of, let's say, it's a property that's rented out, then you will receive the rent. Or if it's money that is invested, you will receive um, interest. And then the person at the end, when the trust is, is wind up, when the trust comes to an end and the the money are in the trust or the property in the trust is then given to some a beneficiary. That beneficiary is then called a, the capital beneficiary. The parties to a trust, um, as I've said, there's three persons or three parties, a trustee, a trust founder, 
and a beneficiary. And the trust itself contains the property which generate income or is paid out as capital. So the trust, the origin of a trust um, in South African law, it, it is from English law that we originally got the idea from the, of a trust. Um, there was, of course, during the British occupation of South Africa, there were English lawyers and they were trained in England and they uh, were the trust law is very well developed. So they bring the idea of the trust to South Africa. But in South Africa, it was developed um, differently. It's no longer the same as the English law of trusts. So initially in our law, you will see there's a 1915 case, Estate Kemp versus McDonald's trustee, in which the trust was equated with a fideicommissum. But um, in 1984, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, appellate division held that it is a, not a, a fideicommissum, it is a sui generis institution, meaning um, it is something on its own. It's it's not some it's not the same as a fideicommissum. It's a, a legal institution on its own, um, but also important in Brown versus Blunt, it was held that it a trust is not a legal person. It does not have juristic personality. But you will see that um, in some um, respects there is. There is um, other acts in which the trust is treated almost like a juristic person, um, but we will come to that later. But uh, according to our case law, the trust is not uh, a juristic person. And as I've said earlier, we have an act in this area, an act of 1988, the Trust Property Control Act, which regulates written trusts and this is overseen by the master. So why do one use a trust? There's a few examples. You can use it to protect beneficiaries such, such as minors. If you have a will and you have want to leave property to a minor, um, we've said in the previous lectures that minors are not can't get the money, it goes to um, the, the guardian's fund if you leave the money. So it's better to, to create a trust to make the, benef the miners the beneficiaries of this trust, and then they can receive income from the trust um, for, their, um, while they, for their schooling or whatever it is that they need. <clears throat> um, you can also protect your assets from creditors because you remove your assets from your estate and you put it in a, a trust estate. But this is only in living trusts because, of course, a trust mortis causa will only be put in place um, at the death of the testator. But if you use a living trust, then you can for instance, remove your house from your estate and you put it in a trust and your family members are all beneficiaries of this trust and so the house is then there for their benefit and if you go insolvent, that house cannot be, um, the creditors cannot claim, have it does not have a claim on that. You, and that is also what estate planning is about. Um, you can reduce inheritance tax, estate duty, by taking property out of your estate and thus prevent your, your trust, your, your estate from growing too much. But um, as far as the, the trust mortis causa goes, it's then mainly to protect beneficiaries. Um, I think I've, uh, okay, so the Trust Property, Property Control Act uh, regulate written trusts. Uh, um, that's trusts created in a trust instrument such as a, a will, and the master of the high court has oversight. Oral trusts are possible in our law, but they're not regulated by the act. 
But um, oral trusts, um, that we don't find that very often because uh, third parties is usually reluctant to deal with a trust that is not does not have its paperwork ready to see what what is the trustee's um, duties and functions and so on. Uh, but you can also create a trust orally and then reduce it to writing afterwards. Then it is again regulated by the Act. So we will discuss the trust mortis causa, a trust created in a will. It's always in writing because wills have to be in writing. So it will always be regulated by the Trust Property Control Act. Okay, the types of trust that we get. Um, Mr. Matsumella, if you can just tell me, are you following the questions in the chat? Mr. Matsumella? Yes, Prof, I can see the chats now. Um, okay. They say that the screen doesn't it's show. It says uh, the screen doesn't show. Would it be able to show once the recording is uploaded? That's one of the question. And there is another question on which page on the slides are we on? I think so, we are on page eight now. So can't you see the slides? I can see them, Prof. I'm following you quite perfectly. So I can see that you are on page okay. eight. Okay. Okay, then um, let me just then continue. Uh, the, the trust inter vivos versus the trust mortis causa. You will see that um, trust uh, inter vivos is created between living persons. It's created while the founder is alive. It's created by means of a contract. Um, and the contract is categorized as a stipulatio alteri, a contract between two parties for the benefit of a third party. We, you will deal with this in um, in the law of, of contract, um, but I'm just giving you some background information here. So you will see that with the trust inter vivos contract law applies to the formation and revocation of that type of trust and to the acquisition of rights by beneficiaries. But the Trust Property Control Act applies to the administration thereof. Now, now the trust mortis causa, um, as I said, is created by a testator in his will. It only takes effect after the death of the testator. The, the literal meaning of mortis causa is death is the cause. Causa, cause, and mortis is then, uh, death is the cause. Mortis refers to death. So someone who do, do something because of an awareness that death is approaching, um, that, that is what mortis causa means. Um, and its administration is regulated by the Trust Property Control Act. Now, other descriptions of of trusts that we find is ownership trust versus a Bevin trust. I've yeah, referred to that. Mr. Matsumella, um, your speaker is on. Ownership trust versus a Bevin trust. Um, so that depends on uh, who is the owner. That if, if the owner is a trustee, then we're working with an ownership trust. If the beneficiary is the owner, we call it a Bevin trust. Now, whoever is the, the owner also determines the rights of beneficiaries, whether it's a personal right or a real right, because if you are the owner, you as the beneficiary is the owner, then um, you have a real right on the property, whereas if you are um, the um, uh, whereas if the trustee is the owner, then the beneficiary has a personal right. Mr. Mitsumela, if, if, if you lose me, you must please interrupt because uh, I don't want to stop and start the whole time. So just come in if you, if you can't hear me or if there's something wrong with the slides. Okay, the second... Not yet, not yet, bro. Okay, the second type of trust we get 
is a discretionary trust versus a non-discretionary trust. Um, now, the, the, there the question is, does the trustee have a discretion to choose beneficiaries from a specified group of people or are they fixed? So if the trustee, if the testator in his will says he leaves the, the property in trust for the benefit of his children, and the trustee can choose which child need, need to be looked after, needs the money, then that's, the trustee has, has a discretion, and we call it a discretionary trust. A non-discretionary trust is someone where the trustee does not have a discretion. The, the, the beneficiaries are fixed. Now, this has an influence on the vesting of the rights of the beneficiaries. If the trustee has a discretion, the beneficiaries do not have vested rights. There's a long discussion of this topic in the textbook. Um, but I think if you keep this basic um, concept in mind, then you, it's easy to follow. So only if there is an, a, a, if the trustee beneficiaries are fixed, then it also means that the rights have vested. Um, but if, if the trustee has a discretion as to who to choose, then um, these, the, the, their rights have not vested yet. Sometimes people also talk about family trust. That's just a general description of a type of trust where what that is used to secure interests and protect the property of a group of family member, members. It's very often created inter vivos. Um, important to remember is that the trust should not be the alter ego of the founder. So if you create a trust while you're still alive, you cannot go on and use that property as if it's still your property. You've put it in a trust and the trustee must be able to act independently from the trust founder. A business trust is also sometimes referred to. Uh, also, sometimes uh, we account, uh, we get people talking about a business trust. Now, important, if you create a trust, you the trustees must be given the power to carry on a business explicitly. Otherwise, the default position of a trust is that you cannot run a business with it. So unless you give the powers to the trustee explicitly to run a business, um, you cannot do so. Um, so a business trust is then there to, to run a, base, a, a business and to make a profit. Trust and other legal figures, um, Braun versus Blan and Boerta held that a trust is a sui generis legal concept. It's not a fideicommissum, as was held in earlier case law. And it's not a legal person, but sometimes it is treated as one in specific acts. For example, it must pay tax. So uh, 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 if you create a trust, that, that trust is also taxed. Trust versus fideicommissum. Uh, to distinguish a trust from a fideicommissum, you will see that a trustee uh, is not beneficially entitled to the fruits and use of the property, it only has an administrative interest. Whereas in a fideicommissum, the fiduciary is beneficially entitled um, to the property. Um, I see here the, a, a, a message, but I can't really react now to messages. If you cannot see my slides at this stage, then maybe the problem is on your side because Mr. Matsumela can see it. So I will upload the slides afterwards and we will also upload the presentation afterwards. Um, maybe you can leave and come back and see if that helps. Okay. A trustee occupies a quasi-public office, whereas a fiduciary does not occupy an office. Um, administration of the trust is supervised by the master and the courts because of the act. A fideicommissum is not supervised by the master. The provisions of the fideicommissum has to be enforced by the parties involved. In other words, the fiduciary has 
the fide commissary has to make sure that the fiduciary uh, uh, treats the property as he is supposed to do. Um, if a trust fails, the trustee is not entitled to the property, whereas if a fide commissary fails, if there's not a fide commissary, I mean if a fide commissum fails, then the fiduciary is entitled to the property. Uh, a trust does not fail if there is no trustee, whereas a fide commissum fails if, if there is not a fiduci fiduciarius. Okay, so this is just a distinction between what it, the difference between a trust and a fide commissum. Just one second. Sorry about that. OK, now we look at the essentialia for a trust, the essential requirements for the creation of a trust mortis causa. First of all, the testator must have the intention to create a trust. This intention must be expressed in a way that create binding obligations for establishing a trust. The trust document must comply with the formalities for it will. The trust property must be determined or determinable. The trust object must be clear. In other words, who is to benefit must be clear. And the trust object must be lawful. It may not be contra bonus mores. An example um, um, of the trust object, um, that is, you can have people as uh, beneficiaries, sorry, but sorry, you can prof. also have. Hello, Prof. Yes. I don't know whether it's me or yes. not, but we are still on, you are still on page eleven where there you show the difference between a trust and fide commissario. We didn't. Okay, now you are on page twelve, Prof. Okay, sorry about that. Um. I don't know what's going on here. I have two slides. On the one, um, I thought I'm just monitoring the discussion, but for some reason, it seems to me that slide is the one that is working. But in any case, um, thanks for alerting me to that. Um, so as we've said, the test data must have an intention to create the trust that must be expressed in a way that create binding obligations. The document must comply with formalities. The property must be determined or determinable. The object of the trust must be clear and the object must be lawful. Um, you can benefit persons, benefit, then it's, um, for, uh, for example, your children. Um, and you can also benefit institutions like charitable institutions in which case we refer to that as a trust at pias causas. Pias is like uh, pious. In other words, uh, it's almost like in the old days it would be for religious uh, causes, but we interpret it widely these days. So a charitable trust would be, for instance, if you leave money for, for the benefit of animals or um, the church or something like that. And now in our law, um, the provisions of trusts at Piaz Causa is treated uh, benevolently. And we also have a doctrine, the CIPRE doctrine, that's applicable. The CIPRE doctrine just states that if it's in the case of a charitable trust, not sure um, if we're not sure who the the beneficiary is, then we can, in, or if the beneficiary that you appointed is no longer um, in existence, then we can, then they can, the trustee can choose another beneficiary that is as near as possible to the original one. Move to another slide, please. Sorry. You are still on slide number 12. Can you please move to slide number 13?
I don't know what's going on now. Is it still on, on Essentialia? Yes, Prof, it's still on Essentialia. Yeah, but that was, I was still talking about that. I was talking about okay. that last aspect on the slide, um, trust at Pia's causes. Okay. But okay, now we come to, I don't know if there's a way, when you see the slides, do you see the small ones at the bottom as well as the one at the top? I can see the one which says core elements, but this one's, I, I can see them. I don't know about the others, but I can see everything. It's just they are too small. Now this advice, check your screen slightly above the recording sign. There's a left arrow and a right arrow shown slide 12 of 22. Click the right ar arrow to move with the slide. Okay, but my problem is not so much moving with the slide. My problem is to enlarge the slide. Okay, but I see the students, they don't have a problem. They're saying that they are Okay, we will upload fine. the slides. So if you can't see them clearly now, yeah, good. We core elements, we, we're coming to the core elements for a trust. Um, the sort of the, that what, what it, it is that makes a trust. The one thing is that the trustee is in a fiduciary position, a position of trust. I think I'm losing signal. Do you still hear me because? Um, yes, we can hear you, Prof. Can you still hear me? Yes, Prof. Because on my side, it, it's something is wrong. Okay, now I think I'm even, back in. Even the students can't um, hear me. And for this load, this load shading thing is difficult anyway. Let's see. Okay, the first thing about in trust is that it is a, the trustee is in a fiduciary position. The trustee must always put the interests of beneficiaries first. So the beneficiaries must be able to trust the trustee to act in their interest, not in his own interest. Also important is that the trustee has a separate estate from the trust estate. So if the trustee goes insolvent, the trust property does not form part of his personal state. There's also an aspect called Hi, Prof, we can hear you now. Unmute yourself, Prof, but we can hear you. I'm sorry, um, I got kicked off the internet for a moment. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can, Prof, please proceed. Okay, lastly, a trusteeship is an office. So the trustee has duties and obligations and is subject to supervision. Um, okay, th this brings us now to the trustee. The trustee can be a natural person or a juristic person. The trustee is, nom is nominated in the will, and then afterwards, the master must appoint him. Um, after he is given security. The master may also appoint additional trustee if it's an additional trustee if it's needed. Um, and the trustee must be authorized by the ma master and letters of authorities issued in terms of the Trust Property Control Act before they can act. Um, now, these two, two uh, concepts that we must take uh, note of here, the power of assumption and the power of subrogation. A power of assumption, if you give that power to the trustee in the will, it means that he has the power to appoint additional trustees. The power of subrogation means 
that the trustee has the power to resign and appoint someone else in his or her place. The trustee is also entitled to re remuneration, payment in other words. You can provide in the will how much he or she must get, or you can, um, or you, he's entitled to reasonable remuneration. And <clears throat> trusteeship ends when the trustee dies or resigns or is removed. Now, there is situations where the master can remove the trustee. Um, for instance, if he goes insolvent or is declared mentally ill or convicted of a crime of dishonesty, a trustee can also be removed by the court if the court is satisfied that the removal will be in the interest of the trust and beneficiaries. But very important, when a trust, uh, when a trustee resigns or is removed, the trust does not come to an end. The master will appoint a new trustee. Duties of a trustee, the lodge, um, he must lodge the will with the master. He must pay master's fees. He must give notice of his address to the master. Um, all of these is listed in... You, you are breaking, Prof. We can't hear you. I'm sorry. She I was starts, kicked she off start going on from duties. Home. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm so sorry. It's because of load shedding. I think that this is happening. Um, the power supply is not as strong. So my internet comes and goes. Duties of a trustee, um, he must lodge his will with, with, will with the master, must give security for the proper performance of his or her duties. He must know what his power, he, he must know what the powers are, he, what powers he has by studying the trust instrument. Um, then he must get control and ownership of the trust property. He must administer it as directed by the will and by law must act with high degree of care, skill and diligence, open a separate trust account, identify trust property and keep it separate from his own. Um, all of this you will find in your textbook. So um, you don't really have to, to, to look at the slides here because it's all just from the textbook. You must account to the master and to the beneficiaries for his, what he's doing must act in good faith and avoid conflict of interest. Um, he must exercise his discretionary decision-making himself. Um, may act that if there is more than one trustee, they must act jointly. They must collect all the debts and ensure reasonable return on income-producing property and must keep trust documents for five years. Apart from uh, from duties, they also have powers, but the powers of a trustee is determined by the content of the trust instrument, the will in other words. He has a fiduciary duty to act like a bonus, a diligence part of familias, which is just a standard to say he must act like um, uh, the... Um, um, you must act with great care because when, you, you, when you're dealing with other people's property. Act with due diligence and care. You act under supervision of the master. Must exercise powers to the advantage of the beneficiaries. That brings us to the beneficiaries. We will see that it can be natural persons or juristic persons. The trust, it's, a trust itself can also be a beneficiary. A trustee may be a beneficiary, but then there must be other trustees as well. Um, the founder can also be a beneficiary. Um, there's two types of trusts, income trusts, income beneficiaries, I mean two types of beneficiaries, income beneficiaries and capital beneficiaries. We have already referred to that. 
Vesting of rights in a trust, it depends on the type of trust. We've also referred to that previously. Um, and we've said that if the, 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 the trustee has a discretion, the investing is postponed until he has exercised his discretion. Uh, a capital, ben in the case of a Bevin trust, of course, the beneficiary already has ownership. The power of the court to vary trust provisions. The court has the power to vary trust provisions in terms of common law. Um, then they, the court may vary or delete provisions if it's imperative to do so, or if the provisions are contra bonus mores. So against the policy, the good mores of society, which the, in these days include the provisions of the, the constitution, the Bill of Rights. <clears throat> There's also a statutory power to vary trust provisions. The court have, have the power in terms of the Trust Property Control Act to change the provisions of a trust. Now you'd see that there is a few conditions that must be in place. And the trust instrument must contain provisions which brings about consequences that was unforeseen by the founder, that hampers the achievement of the object of the trust, or prejudices the interest of beneficiaries, or is in conflict with the public interest. If one of these three things is in place, the, or there must be unforeseen consequences, There must be unforeseen consequences, and these consequences must have a certain result. Namely, it hampers the achievement of the objects of the trust, it prejudices the interests of beneficiaries, or it is in conflict with the public interest. If one of these things is in place, then the court may delete or vary such provision, must, may substitute property for other property, or might terminate the trust if the court thinks such an order is just. Now, there's also a discussion of the Hanukkah versus Void case in the textbook, um, in which the parties have agreed to amend the trust deed, um, go through the facts of that case, uh, case carefully. A termination of a trust, trust comes to an end when the trust object is realized. If the trust assets is destroyed without the fault of the trustee, if the trust fails because there's no beneficiary or the object is impossible, when there's acceleration of the benefits to the ultimate beneficiary, in other words, when the ultimate beneficiary becomes entitled to the, the, to the property of the trust. Um, if the court orders it to be terminated, or when the trust is sequestered, if there's a sequestration of the trust, where the trust has, in other words, more um, credit, creditors than it has money, and it can be sequestrated. The effect of a termination of a mortis causa trust is that the benefits that are left over falls into the residue of the estate, or in the case where the world didn't, didn't refer to a residue, and then it will be divided amongst the interstate heirs. <laughs> okay, that is the end of the, my presentation on trusts. Trusts is, a, is discussed in the textbook in detail. Um, so there's not that much to understand. It's basically just a case of you have to study the content of, of the work. Um, I'm just trying to find the next slide. Um, can you still hear me or see me, Mr. Matsumela? I can still hear you and I see we are still on Page 22, that is the termination of a trust. I think now we have to move on to collation.
Do you still see the slide? Uh, because um, I thought I removed the slide. Yeah, I still see trust, tabulation of trust. I don't know how that is possible. Um, I'm just trying to find the other set of slides. I'm sorry. I don't know. This morning, everything seems to be a bit of a mess. Um, I'm just going to leave and come back, see if it if it makes a difference. Sorry about this. Okay, I'm back. Um, I hope you can see the slides on collation now. And nice I do apologize. I do apologize for this the message this morning. I'm not sure why it is like this. So we're talking about collation. Collation and uh, the the Latin phrase uh, to refer to this concept is collatio bonorum. And in Afrikaans or in Dutch, it's inbring. So what what is this what does this mean so collation what do you see at the moment mr mazzamella uh yeah on page two what is collation okay collation is a process where in both testate and interstate succession under certain circumstances certain benefits that a descendant received from a deceased ascendant during the deceased's lifetime must be collated, taken, in other words, taken into account when the estate is divided before he or she may inherit. And that is to ensure a fair distribution of the estate among all descendants. The basis of the duty to collate is the presumption that a parent, a grandparent, etc., intends equality in the distribution of his or her estate amongst descendants. So from this, it's clear that it is only descendants on which collation is to which collation is applicable. And it's also only certain benefits that you've received during the dis, during the lifetime of, of the person that you must collate. So in, so what this means is, for instance, if a testator has two children and is given certain benefits to the children, then after his death, you have to decide whether that benefits that they received during the testator's lifetime is something that we must take into account when we divide the estate. Um, that will usually be then when one of the children has been benefited to an uh, to an extent that is out of pro proportion to what the other uh, child has received. And then there's this presumption that the parent would want to treat the children equally. Of course, you can make it clear in your will that you do not want to treat them equally, in which case, and you can also clearly state that you do not want collation to be um, part of the process. So the intention of the testator is what is important. I'm just trying to move on. Who must collate who can, and who can enforce collation? It's only descendants that, that must collate and also it's only descendants that's entitled to collation. Um, also, this descendant must have been an interstate heir if there had not been a will. 
and then the the the, the benefit the, uh, the descendant must accept a benefit in in the will. So, in other words, if if you are the testator dies, he has a child and he has a grandchild. The child and the grandchild are both descendants. But because the child is alive, the grandchild would not have inherited interstate. The child would inherit. So therefore, the child is um, musculate, but not the grandchild, because the grandchild would not have been an interstate heir. Now, the same people who who are in who must collate are also the people who can enforce collation from other parties and who, can, who are then entitled to benefits that are collated by other people. That, that's so remember that if you're a descendant and you inherit as a legatee or a usufructuary or a fiduciary, you are not obliged to collate. Um, nor are ascendants, collaterals, or strangers obliged to collate. So you must inherit an inheritance, not a specific thing, but a, a share of the estate. Where a testator nominates both her children and grandchildren as her heirs in her will, there's no obligation on the grandchildren to collate, since they would not have inherited interstate from the testator if she died without a will. But grandchildren who inherit by representing their predeceased parent are obliged to collate. They must collate not only what they themselves received, but also what their predeceased parent received from the testator. When must be collated? Descendants, as described above, must always collate unless the will or other evidence indicates that the testator did not intend collation to take place, or if there's other evidence, unless the persons entitled to collation have waived the right to collation. In other words, they chose not to enforce it. So you must collate unless the intention of the testator was that you, you need not collate or unless the person who is entitled to the collation says it's not necessary for you to collate. Um, and what must be collated? What benefits must be collated? So it's always the intention of the testator that determines whether benefit is collatable or not. But unless there's a contrary intention, Um, unless there's, unless it's not, if it's not clear from the wall what must be collated, then we usually follow the the following guidelines. We say that benefits that must be collated is benefits received by a child as part of his or her inheritance. So a child wants to buy a house before his parent die, and his parents say, "Okay, I will give you." 100,000 so long, which you would have inherited, but I will give it to you in the meantime. You receive this because it's part of your inheritance. That must be taken into account when the estate is um, then divided after the death of the testator. Also, if you give somebody money to help him with his occupation or with his business, you get a business started. started. Or when you give it, um, when your daughter marries, marries, and you want to give her a dowry, that is also a benefit that must be taken into account with collation. But that does not usually include if it, the wedding itself, the reception itself. Money you spend on the reception are not usually considered to be benefits that you must collate. Um, the idea here was, according to the old writers, is that the wedding reception was actually held for the benefit of the parents and for their standing in the community, not so much for the child. But I think that idea has changed in recent um, 
in recent times. So uh, we will see when something like that, that gets to a court, whether how they will interpret it. So these are guidelines that we can follow, that we get from common law. Um, it's not hard and fast rules because the intention of the test data will determine whether it's collatable or not. If you give someone a substantial gift, that uh, you are breaking up, Prof. Sorry, I. Yes, sorry, I'm give, back. Uh, if you, if you give somebody a substantial gift. can continue from there. Yes, um, I, I fortunately on my side, I hear when there's a, a interruption, it gives a noise, makes an echo. So um, I will then just wait for, for, for the connection to be restored before I continue. Okay, so we're discussing the benefits that must be collated. And I've said that if you give it a gift, but that must be a substantial gift that will result in unequal treatment, then that benefit must be also included that gift, uh, and if debts that was owed to the testator, it might even be debts that you owe for such a long time that it has um, prescribed. In, this, in our prescription, we will deal with later in law of contract. Um, prescription means that after a certain time, a debt can be wiped out, because if you do not enforce the debt for a lot, very long period of time, um, then we say the debt has prescribed, right? but you can even in the you can even um, in you can even insist that prescribed debts must be um, brought uh, must be collated. Now benefits that we will not consider as benefits that a, a deceased or a descendant must collate is gifts given out of generosity or benefits that you give a child for services rendered. In other words, let's say you have an elderly parent and the child looks after this parent and the parent gives the child, um, let's say, her jewelry. Um, that can be considered as a benefit because of the services that the child give. And we will not say that that must be collated. And also the, the normal expenses that a parent has to maintain and to educate their children. That should also not be considered as benefits that you must collate. Um, how is collation affected? In other words, how does it take place in practice? Now, it's important that you do not take this benefit. Let's say 200,000 Rand was given to a child uh, for an overseas trip. You do not say that you must now pay that money into the estate. It's just that when you make a distribution of the property, you will take into account that this child already has received 200,000. Um, but... So it, it, it's in reflected in the distribution account. But important uh, for your purposes for the exam, you, do, you need not worry about how to make these collations, uh, uh, these calculations. We do not um, expect you to be able to, to make a good. Uh, we just want you to know the basic idea of collation, um, benefits that must, must be collated, what must not and who is entitled to collation and who can enforce collation and who must bring who must collate so basically just sort of the basics of collation is what you need to know now if we look at this example um, T died in 2022 and left his entire estate in equal shares to his son J his daughter S and his sister P during his lifetime, the testator gave 200,000 to Jay to start a computer business. They also spent 200,000 on a wedding reception for S. Um, now, the testator's sister feels that she's not receiving a fair share of the estate because they're supposed to inherit in equal shares, Because, but she says 
well, the children have already received a lot of money, I must receive more. So now let's look at the position with regard to collation in these facts. Does J and S have to collate their benefits? Now, the basic rule was that the son who received money to start a business, he will have to collate. But the daughter who have received money for a wedding reception need not collate. Now, I would argue that an argument can be made that these two uh, received an equal amount of money and that maybe collation is not appropriate in these circumstances. But you will probably then have to go to court if you want to change this basic understanding of the fact that a wedding reception money need not be collated. Um, is P entitled to collation, the sister? No, she's not because she's not a descendant. So she cannot actually enforce collation. It is only the son and the daughter who can decide whether the other, uh, so in this case, the, the, the daughter can say to the brother, okay, we received both received the same amount of money. Uh, we were equally treated. You don't have to collate uh, your part. Then you, he doesn't have to go to court to, to, get, to have this um, um, end result. So the people who can enforce collation is, is, is the daughter and the son. Um, and in this case, it will be the daughter who can enforce collation because um, as a general rule, she need not collate the money she received. Um, that will now bring brings us to the end of um, collation. I must now just make sure, I don't know how to stop sharing. Um, because I'm not really sharing my screen, I'm sharing some other way, and I'm not sure how that happened. Oh, here it says stop sharing, stop presenting. Okay, so now we've left the slides. Now I can see um, if there is any questions, and Mr. Matsumela, you will have to unmute the student that wants to ask a question and then they or you must enable their mic and they must then unmute themselves before they can ask a question so if there is a question um, please put up your hand okay so far there's no questions by hand i will let me look at the chat Um, oh, Mr. Matsumala, you've kept up with the, the chat questions. So, can you still hear me, Mr. Matsumala? Yes, I can still, I can hear you. Okay. Both. And you've answered the questions in the chat, so we can just wait for hands yeah. to come, come up. Okay, yeah, I see we, this. We, we, there, there's, there's, there, was, there, is, there was a question. It says, good day, Prof. Can I cancel a trust? And I said, unfortunately, you can't cancel a trust. Um, I suppose it, me it depends on what you mean by cancel a trust. If you've created a trust in a trust deed. Yes. Um, how would you cancel a trust? What do you mean by that? Um, it's vague. Yeah, the trust founder will have to, 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 to keep that right to cancel the trust. He will have to include that in the provisions of the trust. Otherwise, he won't be able to, to bring the trust to an end. But I suppose if you do put that in your trust provisions, then you should be able to bring the trust to an end. But it will have to be something that you specifically provide. Otherwise, I don't think you would be able because... Once you have created the trust and you've given the property in trust, it's no longer your property and you cannot deal with it like you wish. So I think as a general rule, you won't be able to cancel. Okay. Um, I see there's a hand from Donald Matome. I can't see the last name. Um, can you please enable his mic?
Uh, how do I, I en enable? Can't he, can't he himself then? Um, because I we, will, we are what it. I will. Okay, I've allowed the mic. You go to the name and then there's three dots. You click on that and then it gives you the option. Yeah, it says lower your hand. It says mute participants, uh, disable my uh, mic. Uh, yeah, I'm here now. Thank you. My mic is. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so my question was. Yes. What happens when a trust is terminated due to no trust beneficiary? Uh, does the state stay with the master of the high court? Or like what happens to the state or the trust? No, uh, as I've said that, um, I think we've done that in one of the slides. Um, if, if a trust was created in a will and the trust comes to an end, the trust property will form part of the residue of the estate. So it will go to the people who inherited the residue. Um, if there wasn't any person like that appointed, then it will go to the interstate heirs. Okay, Difoloko, uh, let me unmute, allow your mic. You can ask your question. You must just unmute yourself. Am I saying the name correct, Mr. Matsumela? Yes, Prof. Uh, logo, please come in. Okay. Then can we move on to Jamulani? Um, you must go to your mic at the top. Um, yeah, just you must go to that at the top. There's a mic uh, picture. You must click on that to to unmute yourself. Um, Mr. Matsumela, do you see that if you go to let's say to Jabulani, you click on this, there's more options, and if you click on that, then there's an option that says allow mic. So yes. you can allow the mic in that way, and then Jabulani can unmute himself and ask the question. Good day, Prof. Uh, my question is about the trust that has been created by the testator and specified with the age when the trust will be terminated at the age of 25. And there would be two beneficiaries in that trust. And one beneficiary has already reached the age of 25 and the other is still under 25. And now the estate becomes insolvent. How is the trust continuing in this situation? Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry about the insolvency part. I'm not sure how to, to answer you. Um, what happens when you have a trust that you create for your children? It's better to create two separate trusts if you want both of them to wait until they're 25. Otherwise, you will provide in your trust that the trust will continue until the youngest child is 25. Um, but I'm not sure, you, uh, your question is a bit complicated. You're saying that there's a trust, the one is not 25 yet, and now the trust is insolvent. I think what will, will happen is that the, the, the liquidators of the, the people who are sequestrating the trust will have to pay out uh, the money to the, to the creditors. So I don't think there will be any money left for the for the beneficiaries. Because that's what happened when you are insolvent, is that you you have to pay your creditors now. Yes, what I mean, the creditors have been paid, everything has been paid, but there, there are no funds anymore. Yes, so then the, the trust comes to an end. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mashudu, um, Mr. Matsumela, will you enable the mic? I just want to make sure that you can do it now because next week I'm on leave. Yes. There we go. Mashudu, you can unmute yourself. Hey everyone. Hello. Yes, good day. Hello, Mashudu. Hello. Please come in. Yes, sir. Yes, thank you. 
I just want to ask if maybe, let's say, my brother was uh, given 200,000 for, for starting a business, his own business, and then myself, I was just given a 200,000 as a, maybe as a wedding gift. It means if before uh, the, the estate uh, sharing, meaning uh, they must even consider the one that was given to me as a gift, not uh, as a, something that I've asked. Um, sorry, you broke up a bit. Or was, I don't know if it's on my side or your side, but what you're saying is that you received a gift and your brother received money for... Starting a business. Okay, starting a business. Now, the business, we've said that that money must be bring, must be considered in collation. Your gift, it will depend um, on whether it... Usually, a gift does not have to be, to be um, given back or considered unless it's out of proportion uh, so much money that you 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 would say that this is now very unfair to the other beneficiaries but um, and it depends on the intention of the testator but I think the basic rule is that the gift a gift does not have to be to be collated uh, no, I'm covered thank you thank you I'm covered I'm sorry, the line, um, Mr. Matsumella, can you hear him clearly? Because I couldn't. Yes, uh, he, he said he's covered. Thank you. Okay. And now okay. we are we are we are, we are on Jabulani maybe... again. Sorry, I've forgotten to lower my hand. There's no question. Uh, Donald, again, we are, we are back with Donald. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, I wanted to ask, since it was stated that a trust is not a juristic person, um, when we now speak of a business trust, that, does that now not make the trust uh, juristic in a way, like corporate? And if it is so... Um, can the founder, since it is stated that a founder can benefit, can be a beneficiary to a trust, can they also be a beneficiary to a business trust? That's a sh to a business trust that would be created while they're still alive, not when they're dead, of course. I don't know if it makes sense. Thank you. Mr. Matsumello, I couldn't hear clearly. I think there's a problem on my side. Can you? perhaps repeat and, and answer the student. Donald, can you come again, please? Um, okay, thank you. I was asking, since it was stated that a trust is not a juristic person, when we now speak of a business trust, does that not make the trust juristic? That's my first part of the question. And then, no, it does not make it a juristic person. But then it would be working in in a way that a business does. In that nature. I'm sorry, I don't hear you. Mr. Matsumella, did you hear the question? I thought you, you, you did answer the question. The second one, I don't understand. Maybe okay, so it's exactly. the fact that it's a business trust does not mean that it has to be a juristic person to operate, because I mean you can have uh, people can run a business without um, it being a, you know I can I can operate um, a, a something let's say I'm looking after children at my home I'm I'm operating a crash um, I'm doing it. Now, my personal capacity, that does not make my operation a juristic person. And the courts have held that a trust is not a juristic person. So um, if you operate in a, you can do a business, but because that is the power that was given to a trustee, um, but that does not make it a juristic person. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, 
since there is nothing, I think we can call it a day for today. Yes, and, and I just want to apologize again for, I don't know what I did wrong today with this live sharing thing. So the slides didn't display as it should. Um, and um, also with the load shedding issues on this side, but I hope that you at least learn something from the from the class. We will post the recording and we will post the slides. And then next week I will be on leave. So um, I will leave you in the capable hands of Professor Yamnek and Mr. Matsumela for next week. And uh, I hope you have a good week and we'll see each other again sometime in the future. All right, then. Goodbye. Mr. Matsumela, just stop the recording, please.